Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, this conversation about what I think is the most interesting topic in all of the world, which is the brain. Um, welcome to this session about the era of big neuroscience. So what is big neuroscience? I mean, to me, all neuroscience is big. Uh, but what we have in front of us now is, at this time, technology is advancing that is really accelerating the pace of discovery in brain science. And at the same time, we also have, I think, a really unprecedented coming together of scientists to collaborate um, in neuroscience on a big scale. So joining me today, we have three distinguished scientists to tell us a little bit more about developments in this area and what the future might hold. First, we have Murali Doriswamy, professor of psychiatry and medicine and the director of the Neurocognitive Disorders Program from Duke University in the USA. Uh, this side, we have Alan Jones, chief executive officer of the Allen Institute in the United States. And we also have Dr. Mu Ming Pu, director of the Institute of Neuroscience from the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Shanghai. So I'd like to start by asking each one of the speakers, what does big neuroscience mean to you? And why is big neuroscience happening now? Raleigh. Thank you. Greetings, everybody. Uh, there is, of course, uh, no health without mental health and brain health. It's the fundamental basis for everything we do from the time we are born till we die. So to me, big neuroscience, I'm not just a scientist. I'm also a physician. I think uh, we have two eminent uh, neuroscientists who will discuss about why big projects in brain science can help us better understand the workings of the brain and how that translates to virtually every field, whether it be economics, whether it be robotics, whether it be artificial intelligence, uh, et cetera. But to me, ultimately, discovery of brain science has to come back to improve our health in three stages of life. Early childhood development. I think we all saw some astonishing research about a year ago showing that children who are born in low-income families their brain development is much slower. In fact, the surface area of their cortex was found in one study to be about 6% smaller than children born in more affluent families. And that's very relevant for this conference and what can we do to reverse that. In midlife, neurological and mental health disorders account for the biggest disability and loss of work. China and India account for nearly one third of worldwide disability due to neurological and mental disorders, and we need to do more about helping those individuals. In late life, we need to help people with dementia, find ways to keep our cognitive functioning a lot more uh, 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 longer, and to try to see if they find ways to prevent dementia as we all live longer. So that, to me, is the meaning of what I think big neuroscience can achieve. Alan? So, the perfect uh, uh, setup for Morali. So, um, we like to think of the brain and um, our lack of understanding of it as if someone would hand you a cell phone. If I handed anyone here a cell phone and said, tell me exactly how this works, not in general, but tell me exactly how it works, how would you go about doing it? Um, and the things that we think about and technology is now really ripe for showing us is to figure out exactly how that is. So one of the first things we're going to do is we're going to take it apart. We're going to start to look at all the chip architecture. We're going to look at all the parts, the structure of this phone. But that's simply not enough. That tells you something, but not enough. So then you actually have to turn the phone on. And you have to under understand the underlying operating system, uh, the basic wiring of how this works when it's on. And the final thing you have to do is understand the apps that are running on top of it. This is the cognition behavior, et cetera. So we know the need which is enormous uh, for understanding the brain, but we know almost nothing about how this phone works. And thankfully, a number of technologies in the field of neuroscience have been progressing quite rapidly so that in the period of about the last five years, um, it's finally caught up and a time is right for doing a very systematic, large tackling of how understanding how the brain works. So the uh, brain is the, probably the most complicated object on, in the universe. Now, for a scientist, we always want to know the, uh, uh, the understand nature, and one can consider the brain 
because the inner world uh, that, uh, the, uh, that is, uh, represents the ultimate uh, frontier of uh, scientific understanding. Now, we everybody who, uh, anybody who, I, uh, who uh, during their uh, lifetime will face problems with their brain, as well as uh, if they, are, uh, they want to learn the, uh, about the world, they want to understand their own brain. So there are several aspects of uh, big science, of uh, uh, that uh, big neuroscience that are facing. We want to understand the brain. We also want to the brain health. Uh, want to protect our brain. We want to know how it uh, develops, how it becomes creative. And there's also uh, interest of understanding brain coming from uh, intelligence technology, because uh, the, the artificial intelligence has reached a time that we need to know why brain so efficient with uh, uh, a few tenths of watts uh, power consumption, you beat uh, the biggest supercomputers in the world. Uh, the, the, why it's so efficient? So understanding the, uh, the, uh, how the brain works will make, uh, 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 will inspire new technology. Right? So, the, so all this understanding the brain, uh, protecting the brain, and simulating the brain would be the biggest goal. But to achieve this, it's not an individual small lab uh, that can do it. Uh, we, we, we can say for this, for example, if you look at the Nobel Prize winner uh, that given to uh, in the physiology and medicine over the last century, about one quarter of them are neuroscience related. Uh, so we, they are all small laboratory. They can make a fundamental breakthrough in one aspect of, of, the, of the brain. But there's not a single uh, brain disorders that we have a complete solution to it. Uh, the psychiatric, uh, take psychiatric uh, uh, diseases. We are uh, in 21st century, but the most drug use is, uh, is 1950s drug. Uh, we are way behind in, in finding a cure to protect uh, for the disease and protecting our brain. But to solve any one of these disease problems or to understand the brain, to work out in networks within the complex uh, brain, we need a large number of people working together. We need large resources devoted to it, like Manhattan Project, like uh, a goal of, uh, of putting people together to solve a big problem like a uh, human genome project, uh, like a big accelerator project, finding the God particle, right? So all this uh, is achieved because there are hundreds and thousands of uh, scientists working together. So brain science has reached the stage that we need to do this. And it's been, it's, everybody realized this, and, and, and the government realized this, so uh, there's a wave of interest last five years uh, of uh, in nearly every country, advanced countries in the world, developing countries in the world are putting efforts in, into big science, big brain science, because this is uh, what we need to do. So can we talk a little bit more about what big brain science looks like? So is it that we have thousands of people working on a similar problem, or is it that thousands of people are putting their resources together to you know, work on a, a single issue um, and to create, create something for the community? Do you want to? Take this. Sure. Um, I guess I view the, the big science, it's, it's a combination of things. So, so there are large scale efforts um, across the globe. Um, I am the head of one in Seattle that's funded by, privately, by, not by me, but by Paul Allen, of, a co founder of Microsoft, to the tune of about a billion dollars. Um, that is complemented by the, the work in Europe, uh, there's a big, uh, it's called the Human Brain Project. Um, that is looking at modeling uh, the brain, uh, doing a lot of different things. There's uh, the, now the groups in Asia who are looking at uh, much more disease focus. Um, so there, there are, and all of these are about taking things to scale. Um, so it's, uh, as Mu Ming was saying, um, you know, much of neuroscience up to this date has been dominated by individual investigators going after specific hypotheses. Um, it's the life spread of, 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 um, of the, the neuroscience world 
However, now is the time to really start to tackle these things in a, in a, in a way that sets the foundation for everything to follow. Any other definitions of big neuroscience? Well, as a clinician, um, to speed up drug development, one of the bottlenecks is how can we enroll large numbers of patients and caregivers in clinical trials, which is a huge bottleneck for drug discovery. The second bottleneck is the development of efficient biomarkers that can give us an early signal of whether a drug will work or not work. And for both of these, I think, to me, big neuroscience uh, can use crowdsourced information. I think increasingly, for example, through brain registries, through apps, for example, in the Apple Health Kit, uh, even WeChat, other messaging services, if we can somehow create large networks of patients that are interested in volunteering their time for research, it can dramatically accelerate the time to bringing drugs to market. And I'll give you one example. Um, so for example, at Duke, uh, we launched an app, not myself, one of my colleagues launched an app for autism. Normally, to recruit children and families with autism would just take months and months and months, and maybe in a single center, you can recruit 100 families over maybe two, three years. With an app, you, they have already recruited 5,000 families within like four or five months of the launch of the app. And the families are uploading videos onto the app. They're uploading clinical information. They can do rating scales. So it dramatically revolutionizes how we can do research. Mm -hmm. So how is digital uh, in digital technology impacting other areas of, of neuroscience? For example, uh, uh, we can uh, develop apps that, uh, that people can use to, uh, uh, to diagnose their brain conditions. Right? You, can, you can play a, 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 a program and figure out uh, are you a sensory perception is deteriorating, your working memory, your memory capacity deteriorating. All these are data can be collected by simply playing a, a game. And this can be collected by physicians, uh, monitor the progressive brain health uh, during your uh, long period of time. And the physician, based on this, they can do proper diagnostic. They are, not, they are prescribing your functional defects of your brain, not based on asking a question or filling a, a, a questionnaire to, uh, to, uh, to diagnose your problem, but based on quantitative data, progressive quantitative data on the state of your brain. Uh, that, that, would, that would be uh, digital. Uh, that's the integration of a medical diagnostic uh, 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 approach with digital technology. And furthermore, once you have a, 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 a brain functional defect, let's say your, work, your memory, working memory uh, is deteriorating, you can remember a uh, telephone number for more than two, two minutes, uh, then uh, there, could be, uh, there will be app available for you to, tr to train you to, to practice your brain to uh, improve your working memory. And that will be a, a design in a way that's fun, and also uh, effective, then you, you will be able to, uh, uh, to have an intervention of your uh, de deteriorating brain. Uh, you will prevent your uh, uh, development of Alzheimer's. Uh, you can have uh, programs that tell you how to uh, practice your uh, uh, other aspect of your function as well. So that's an example. So I, I'm gonna turn this just a little bit in a different direction. I, so I like to think that neuroscience is at the stage that chemistry was in maybe 1850. Um, and one of the things that was a real huge move forward in the field of chemistry, um, driven by a lot of different uh, discoveries over the years, was a periodic table of the elements. Um, and, and what we really need and what we're lacking now is that periodic table of the elements that make up our brains, which are cell types or cell classes. Um, we know from years of study that there are, you know, somewhere around 100 billion neurons in the adult human brain, but they're not 100 billion different types of neurons. There's a much lower number. Um, and what those qualities are and how they can make 
many, many different brains, the seven billion brain, brains that are on this planet, which are all basically pretty similar, um, is uh, the result of an underlying genetic plan that ultimately makes these cell classes. So the projects such as the one in the US, uh, the Brain Initiative, the one at the Allen Institute in Seattle, are driving towards getting these fundamental classes, these cell types, building out this periodic table of the elements. And I think the, all the promise that's ahead is something that a lot we can't necessarily see, but it's the um, imagine what we could do once we started to learn about the periodic table and how to start uniquely combining elements in novel ways to make novel chem chemical entities and what that uh, produced, uh, produced uh, in the future. So to your question really around the digital, it's now is the time to start setting standards. Um, the time when these things of the periodic table is gonna be set, they're gonna be data standards, data output standards that we're all gonna wanna get on the same page on because ultimately we're going to be able to decode the language of the brain and we'll want to have a standard language in which we do that. So what do you see as the biggest questions of, in neuroscience that are the first ones that big neuroscience might be able to address? First of all, we need to work out, uh, like a human genome project, we, we know how the DNA, how the sequence of uh, genetic codes that uh, codes are all the proteins in our body. Uh, uh, we want to have a, 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 a basic uh, structured information uh, on, of our brain. How many cell types we have, like what Alan was talking about, how they are connected uh, to form the network. So we need to know the uh, entire, at a cellular level, the connectivity among all these different cell types that generates different functions. Now, uh, with that complete uh, understanding, then we can really understand how the brain works. Uh, now, we, uh, everybody knows about brain imaging, right? We have a brain imaging data, but brain imaging data does not give us enough time and, uh, uh, and uh, spatial resolution uh, uh, to resolve the individual activities in the, in, in the network so we can understand how it works. So we need a higher level, we call uh, brain imaging as a macroscopic level understanding of the brain. We need mesoscopic, mesoscopic, you know, cellular level understanding. And that effort needs, really needs uh, large uh, resources, like what Allen Institute would have, and also a lot of them, large number of people. The, I guess Allen has about up to a thousand now, uh, people working together to, to uh, really dissolve, uh, de determine the cell types and connectivity. Right? Uh, and and uh, this is the biggest uh, goal for big science. One of the big goals for the big science, uh, neuroscience project is to understand the structure. But this is not enough. Once you have the structure, we, what are we as uh, scientists really want to know the function, or how, the, how it works. We need to know the activity map. Remember when, when, when uh, Obama announced the brain initiative, he said, we like to know every spike from every neuron. Uh, that's a goal, that's a really a glory goal that we hope to achieve. Probably uh, it would take 20, 30, 50 years before we can do that because technology hasn't reached that stage. So understanding the, uh, the structure and the activity uh, at a cellular level of the brain, that's the uh, big science go for the big science. Yeah, so clinically, I would say uh, when we talk about common diseases of the brain, like Alzheimer's or multiple sclerosis, we still don't understand these diseases at an individual personalized level. We don't know when these diseases actually start silently in the brain. For example, Alzheimer's, even though we know that when the memory loss starts, we don't exactly know when the pathology begins in the brain. So we need to have a better understanding of the timelines for many diseases. Many neurological diseases also wax and wane, what we call as relapses and remissions. For example, multiple sclerosis, depression, migraine. We don't understand what are the triggers for these relapses and remissions. For example, in Europe, there is a landmark study that just got launched last week called RADAR-CNS, R-A-D-A-R-C-N-S, 
which is planning to use passive monitors, sensors, to see if it can track what happens to these three diseases, depression, multiple sclerosis, and epilepsy, in between the doctor visits. We know what happens at the doctor visits. We don't know what happens in between the doctor visits. So the next challenge is can we develop sensors, passive sensors and active <coughs> sensors, to track <coughs> disease fluctuations? And can we then combine it with genetic data, other kinds of uh, uh, clinical behavioral data to predict when the next relapse or remission is going to happen? So uh, what needs to happen between understanding the structure and the function of brain cell types and actually you know, realizing a public health benefit? You're going to throw that one to me, huh? <laughs> okay. Well, we have to talk together. The basic right. scientists yes. and the clinicians <laughs> in meetings like this. Uh, the, and this is always the challenge, um, um, bridging those gaps. Um, I think, first of all, history has always shown that by doing the foundational, the basic science, that very quick insights from all of the people who are clinicians who are consuming that data um, happens. Um, uh, almost unpredictably, um, but uh, it, it, at least in the ways in which, in the areas in which it actually happens, um, but it's always very rapid. So I think, you know, again, the, the, what we hope is that we're in a time right now where, again, technology allows a lot of sharing, a lot of the tools that maybe have been um, in the realm of uh, academic neuroscientists are now going to be facile and used by clinician scientists who are pushing their way forward to trying to find a cure for some ailment, disease, et cetera. So I think, um, you know, those give me a lot of hope that there's going to be lots of avenues into um, very quick hits for, for the clinic. So the uh, understanding of the structure of the function, the goal is to correlate a particular brain function, how it works at a, at a neural circuit level. Once we know which circuit, which uh, brain area, uh, and what connections involve in particular function, then we can, uh, we can determine when, it's go, when it goes wrong. That's uh, how the disease cause, uh, is caused by. So once, once we know the, the dysfunction, of those circuits, then we can aim our uh, clinical treatment directly at that particular function. Now, uh, the, the, at, at present, uh, with the, the problem with Alzheimer's or with treating, treating uh, psychiatric disease and autism is you don't, we don't know where to treat them. We don't know where is the dysfunction and what circuit that has a problem. So the future of, uh, of uh, uh, clinical treatment will greatly uh, improve in its specificity and precision if we know the structure and function of the, uh, in a normal brain. And then, uh, uh, for, for example, take a, a good example is that the best uh, uh, clinical treatment for severe uh, Parkinson's disease is called uh, deep brain stimulation. The reason they can do this so effective is because we know in uh, Parkinson's disease which area which cell type is, has a problem. So the physician can target right at the area to do deep brain stimulation. But if you want to apply deep brain stimulation to other disease, to psychiatric disease, to that people are starting doing uh, for depression, the problem with that is it's not as effective because we don't know where the circuit we should be stimulating. Uh, uh, so that's why we need to know the structure for uh, for a particular function, and then we can target our, our, our clinical treatment. So how important is it going to be that this research be done in humans as opposed to other model systems? Well, it's going to be very important uh, to do the research in humans, ultimately, because uh, We've seen examples of lots of drugs in the Alzheimer's space. For example, there are at least 200 drugs that can cure Alzheimer's in mice, and they've all failed in human trials. Uh, but the good news is there are new uh, scientific methods using stem cells and other technology. For example, there's this concept of brain in a dish um, that actually was published in Nature, I believe. Um, 
And if we can create models that replicate human brain tissue as closely as possible, there is some hope that perhaps those results will translate and you can screen drugs fast and perhaps then um, uh, uh, maybe rely less on animal models. But I think for toxicity, we're still going to be relying on animal models for drug toxicity. Um, and I think we have not found a good alternative uh, to that yet. Other thoughts? Uh, one of the things that we do at the Allen Institute is partner with uh, surgeons who are going in and actually removing healthy brain tissue to get to a tumor or for epilepsy patients. And uh, the remarkable thing about human tissue is you can keep it alive in a dish for quite some time and do a lot of interesting um, circuit studies and understand um, at least at a level of um, that particular isolated uh, piece of brain uh, that we're looking at in DISH. So um, human biology and the study of it at that level is exceptionally difficult. Um, you get what you get. It's a small number of individuals, um, but the stuff that you do get is so powerful um, because it's directly related to human health. We cannot do experiment on humans. We can observe and we watch symptoms. We can do trial and error type of treatment. But this is not effective. It's an ethical problem. So there's a great need to have animal models that are very close to human, which is what we call non-human primate, monkey. The, having monkey with a brain very similar to humans, if we can generate models that has a disease like humans, it has a circuit like the humans, we can do experiment on them. And so the non-human primate as a model for human disease, development of human disease treatment is very important. Now I agree that the, the, the brain dish, uh, stem cell or induced, uh, the IPS uh, induced stem cell uh, would be an approach. But when you come to the treatment of disease, you have to look at a disease model in a real brain and do the treatment there. So I would stress that in this big science uh, around the globe, uh, there's clear development, clear focus on the uh, non-human primate research in Asia. Beginning with last year's announcement by Japan of a marmoset project, a Japan brain project, similar to brain initiative in, or, or human brain project in Europe. Japan has announced a national project on uh, brand, uh, on, on the brain research, which is focused entirely on marmoset. Marmoset is a small primate. It's a monkey, small monkey that it can, you can, uh, easy to do experiment. It's, uh, uh, you can do genetics on it. You can do disease, uh, manipulate a gene to have model. And a China brain project, which is going to be announced later this year, will have a major focus to develop a, uh, another species of primate uh, called macaque, this larger monkey, which, uh, which brain is closer to, to human. It's harder to do, harder to rear, harder to manipulate than mama said, but it's closer to human. So the, uh, the, the goal for the China Brain Project will be, one of the goals will be uh, to utilize the large resources of macaque uh, uh, monkeys in China to develop animal models that can be used for disease treatment. Now, for example, I mentioned this uh, deep brain stimulation. We, we physicians right now are using deep brain on humans by trial and error, error uh, manner to find the best effective uh, site for treatment. But if we have an animal, we have a monkey who, which has depression, which has uh, addiction, have other psychiatric disease. Uh, uh, we can do experiment on monkey to figure out exactly where we should stimulate before we try it on human. Wouldn't that be a much, much, much more ethical approach to, uh, to develop of, uh, uh, therapy? So I, in this sense, I would argue that the, the current trend in the, in the US and the, in Europe of closing down of primate, uh, non-human primate research is uh, actually uh, uh, a bad thing for, for, for our human uh, medical care uh, future. I, I think uh, 
uh, one reason is ethical uh, issues that the monkey are so close to human, people feel uncomfortable. But uh, even that's uh, one can consider ethical issue of having trial and error test on a human versus on a monkey. <laughs> uh, this ethical issue on human as well, right? So we have to develop a, a, a standard for ethical treatment of animal models. And that has to be improved. Uh, it has to be really uh, uh, satisfying the public's demand. But we cannot give up a primate, a uh, non-human primate as the animal model. And I think that that would be uh, an area that the Asian neuroscientist or Asian big science project would offer to the global uh, neuroscience, at least for the next 20 years. So, uh, on the topic of Asian neuroscience, I mean, one of the issues that's sort of my pet peeve is a lot of the research in neuroscience has come from the West. Uh, and has come from studies of Caucasians. We just published an editorial in a journal where even in Alzheimer's trials, 80, 90% of patients enrolled in these trials are Caucasians and minorities, at least in the US, are underrepresented substantially. And so I think there is, when you're talking about big neuroscience, I think there's also a need for collaboration such as India-China collaboration where, as I mentioned, something like 30, 40% of the disability from um, mental and neurological disorders is going to happen here. The, the infrastructure, the healthcare, the genetics, it's all different. And I think there is tremendous room for those kinds of collaborative big projects. Like I could see an India-China project on Alzheimer's or an India-China project on substance abuse. Uh, and I think I would love to encourage people in this audience and others uh, you know, to, to think of concepts like that. Mm -hmm. So as these big collaborative uh, you know, global projects go forward, what do you see are some of the big challenges like, in the implementation um, that the community needs to think about you know, in order for there to be a payoff from, from this kind of investment? Well, so unlike the, the genome project, for example, where there was a sort of a very clear end goal, uh, we need to sequence three, three billion base pairs and then we can clear, declare victory and we're done. Um, brain science is going to be considerably uh, more complicated with lots of different avenues. So in some sense, um, it's really easy for all of these large-scale projects to stake their territory because the problems are so huge and the needs are so great. Um, at the same time, there's always a need for better coordination and collaboration. Um, we still live in a world, especially in the biological sciences, um, it's amazing, most of the other science, physical sciences um, don't have any problem sharing data. Um, they share it freely, they share it before it's published uh, in great journals like Nature. Um, um, but uh, it's not the case in much of biomedical research that there's a, a true open and sharing concept. Um, and so I think those are going to be some of the biggest challenges because each of these groups is offering something very interesting and unique and powerful. Um, and it's only that much more powerful when it's shared very broadly. So, and this pushes for the need for standards, um, for opening up um, data resources um, uh, as quickly as possible. Um, medical research has some issues around that for patient confidentiality, et cetera, but these things can be worked out. They're, they're, they're smaller problems in the grand scheme of things. So I would say that for me, my perception of the biggest challenge is just is that getting that openness and that sharing uh, across the board. I think the biggest challenge for big neuroscience is a changing culture, a culture in the neuroscience community. Now, uh, unlike the Genome Project, which is mostly technical, the scientific involvement, scientists are not very much involved in, uh, in sequencing. It's the techn technology, the technologists who are who are doing the sequence because the, the, the basics is already, uh, uh, the technology is already developed or being improved by technologies. So, but for the big science project we're talking about in solution of, of uh, structure and function and also disease problem, we need the collaboration of large number of people who used to do small science. So immediately comes about is, uh, is how do you share credit? How do you share your resources? Now, 
uh, everybody is uh, used to an evaluation system for in the American university, even in the, uh, in the Chinese university now, they evaluate the accomplishment of scientists by independent work, not by like, their contribution to a collaboration. Now this culture in biologists and medicine uh, has to change in order for people to get together to share the resources and to be willing to open up their data. Uh, and, and the physicists and astronomers has, have already established a culture. They haven't moved in a big science culture for you know, the last 50 years. Right? You can have a, a project soon for a, a discovery of a particle, a new particle that involves thousands of people. Everybody gets their credit. They are happy with their name on a paper with a thousand scientists. Uh, but they, they are in the community. They recognize who made what contribution. And that's enough for a scientist. But this culture hasn't been established in neuroscience and in biology to the extent that we can really establish big science projects. So I think the biggest project, uh, big problem that I face for long-term big science project is a change in culture, uh, especially change in the institutional way of evaluating scientists. Okay? Uh, that, uh, I think uh, uh, in, in the uni American university, you cannot get tenure if you only have collaborative work. You, you have to demonstrate independent accomplishment. Right? Well, in all major universities, you cannot get tenure. So wh why would a scientist join a big project uh, if they don't have uh, their, their contribution properly evaluated? So, uh, the obvious challenge is, of course, funding. Uh, I think neuroscience is still underfunded relative to some other fields such as cancer, heart disease, uh, especially in the developing world. For India, for example, to justify funding for a big neuroscience project, it has to weigh it against infrastructure, so many other issues. So uh, the second is I think some of the big global philanthropic organizations like the Gates Foundation, et cetera, I don't know if somebody from the Gates Foundation is here, they've traditionally invested in infectious diseases rather than, say, in early childhood brain development, you know, projects like that, which I think uh, uh, are very low-hanging fruit. Um, the third thing is um, expertise. To some extent, uh, developing countries like India still lack the expertise to do large-scale, multi-center, sort of rigorous studies. The many labs may not have the equipment needed to do state-of-the-art, so collaborations with the West, I think, are going to be very important. Um, there's also cultural mistrust when you work, you know, Indian and American collaborative projects. Sometimes it takes uh, uh, cultural barriers to be overcome, so those kinds of uh, mm -hmm. issues. And, and I think the last is uh, uh, it's important for public-private partnerships. It's, it's important to realize that anything we learn in brain science is going to benefit multiple industries. Um, Cognitive neuroscience can help deep learning and artificial intelligence. Anything we learn about diseases can help pharmaceutical companies, uh, hospitals. So I, I think it's very important to create public-private partnerships to make these kinds of big projects work. So can we go into uh, the private partner, uh, public partnership a little bit? So who are the other players who are not in neuroscience, in big neuroscience right now, who need to come to the table? I'd love to have, uh, well, I think a lot of the tech companies are now in neuroscience, whether they admit it or not. They may use words like deep learning and artificial intelligence, but that's really neuroscience. Um, and so I think I would love to have companies like Microsoft. I think Google has multiple projects in uh, Samsung, uh, uh, you know, Chinese companies. Baidu has expressed interest in getting into neuroscience. So I think I would love them because they not only bring money but they bring a different way of thinking about the problem that traditional neuroscientists may not have. And so last year I wrote a blog for the forum website um, asking for the creation of an X prize for Alzheimer's. Not just because of the money, but because an X prize brings, it may bring a small scientist working in a garage somewhere who has a new method of applying to the disease or a new way of thinking that we traditionally in neuroscience have ignored. Because there's a lot of sort of thinking alike within certain communities, so it's good to bring uh, a fresh look mm -hmm. at the problem. So there's obviously a tremendous amount of excitement uh, about the brain and about the prospect of you know, so much talent going into neuroscience at this point. What do you see as a realistic deliverable in the next five years for neuroscience, for big neuroscience? 
Well, the government keeps asking this. <laughs> before, before they approved the China brand project, the first thing they were asked, what, what can you deliver in 15 years? So we scratched our heads and talking with clinicians, with people, uh, to come up with something realistic. So eventually we said, when we presented to the government, we hope to be able, by 2030, to develop of, uh, intervention, early intervention methods for Alzheimer's that would uh, delay the onset of severe symptoms by 10 years. Now, the, you, you know, the, the, most people above uh, 85, now one third of them will have Alzheimer's. But if you delay that by 10 years, the societal burden uh, will be greatly reduced. And we also, for the developmental disease, we want to increase the uh, enrollment school dropout rate, reduce the school dropout rate by 30%. Uh, find uh, intervention methods. Uh, now, uh, we, we actually check with physicians. Now, if we have a developed, over the next 15 years, developed way of intervention, early diagnosis, or well, what would you uh, expect to, we can achieve? So that's a deliverable in terms of medical care, uh, care right? Uh, now, in terms of brain intelligence, uh, by the way, I should mention that in the China Brain Project, the, the, it's a structure of a one body, two wing structure. The central, uh, central uh, pillar of the project is to understand the brain, the cognitive process of brain. But there are two applying wing. One is on the uh, brain, uh, brain disease diagnosis and intervention. The other wing is on the brain-like technology development, brain machine technology. Now, the, uh, this, in this two wing, uh, what do you have a deliverable? Right? So, for the understanding of cognition, we cannot set a de deliverable because we cannot say we will understand consciousness in 30 years or 50 years. <laughs> we, we cannot say uh, we understand in the, these newer circuits for language in human mm -hmm. in 30 years. Uh, we cannot make that promise, right? Uh, but in, uh, in brain machine interface, we can, we can have a goal in, in 15 years that, that's achievable, right? We want a, a, a robot uh, that can do, uh, that can adapt to the environment, to multitasks, uh, that can learn. Uh, that, that, that's a, you, can, you, can, you can have a reachable goal in 15 years, right? With the with, uh, uh, increased power for the artificial intelligence, right? with the brain-inspired computing, new computing methods, with uh, new inspired computing methods that will greatly reduce, increase the efficiency of the computing that are currently available. The current computing is just in energy inefficient, right? So those are achievable goals, I think. Deliver deliverable. Well, I, I think uh, I agree. And Smart prosthetics, I would say it's very deliverable. For example, everybody has already heard of cochlear implants, um, which can dramatically uh, change a person's life. But they've also been shown that in people with cognitive impairment who have hearing loss, something like 40% of people who had cochlear implants, their cognitive impairment was reversed totally. So that's one. Uh, retinal telescopes are now available for treating people with macular degeneration and other problems. Um, and advanced sort of limb prosthetics uh, that are directly linked to the nervous system. So I think those are deliverable clearly within the next uh, 15 to uh, 30 years. I would say um, better diagnostic tests, uh, whether it be for MS, uh, whether it be for Alzheimer's, whether it be for uh, 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 early detection of uh, other neurodegenerative disorders, those are deliverable. Uh, and then closed loop devices. I think uh, you mentioned um, um, deep brain stimulation, but there are other closed loop devices that can automatically diagnose and treat. For example, for epilepsy, there's a device called Neuropace that's implanted. It can detect when a seizure is about to happen and it gives a protective impulse that prevents the seizure uh, from happening. So those kinds of devices, I think, uh, brain machine interfaces uh, are relatively low hanging fruit. 
So, so you asked five years, and basically we started our 10-year plan uh, for Paul Allen, which we promised, and he is making good on his billion-dollar commitment. Um, so I have, our, our team has someone to answer to uh, for deliverables, and ours is, a, is a very focused, um, and again, it gets back to that very basic understanding of what are those cell types. So we think by 2021 that within a mouse, which is processing basic visual information, we will be able to understand in the neocortex, which is the outer part of our brains, which is one processor unit, um, we'll be able to understand the components of that processor unit, the way they're connected up, and the computation that it's making. Um, and I don't think that's an unrealistic goal, um, the way that we're currently going and the way that the field is going. So I'd like to uh, open up the discussion to the audience at this point. Does anybody have any questions for any of the speakers? Do we have someone with a microphone? Yes. Uh, I'm Fu Jun, a professor from Peking University. Uh, I do not do um, brain science. I do political uh, economy. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, this well, the debate uh, so far has been on the negative side of uh, the human brain, not the positive side. By which I mean the creative side, and I guess uh, many people are interested in the creative uh, side of uh, human brain. Now, what research has been done uh, on that part, and how uh, the research so far has figured into uh, a very long-standing uh, debate between nature and the nurture? You mentioned something about the social impact. Uh, and you also mentioned something about uh, language. How language, for instance, uh, have an impact on the activity of the brain? Uh, professor Chomsky, an MIT professor, he claimed that our brain has two structures, a deeper structure to deal more with the generic aspects, whereas the superficial structure to deal with uh, the specifics. That probably has something to do with uh, the linguistic aspects of a human brain. Now, to what extent do you have evidence to support those claims? Uh, well, if you talk about Chomsky's brain, Chomsky's uh, the idea of the innate uh, circuits for language, that's what, uh, this is a hypothesis. And, and uh, we need to figure out the, the circuits uh, underlying uh, the uh, human language, and uh, that circuit has to be different from uh, a, our near neighbor uh, chimps and uh, monkeys who doesn't have language, right? So this is one of the goals that one can uh, look for you know, when we really understand the circuit, uh, the structure of the, uh, the, the uh, primates. Uh, comparatively, uh, comparative studies of primates and non-human, non-human primates and human and figure out what's, what's wrong, uh, what's the difference, right? The, on the other hand, uh, disease, uh, language uh, disorders uh, caused by disease, uh, caused by gen uh, genetic uh, 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 defects, those also provide our understanding why, uh, if we understand the basis of the, the, uh, the language disorder, we can understand uh, in part what's the innate circuit for that happen uh, in the human brain that makes us so, so, so uh, different. Hi, um, I am Ihan. I am from Tsuji Network Technology. We are a uh, digital precision health company. We are trying to bring diagnostic uh, into our earlier stage, which is preventive healthcare. So in order to do this, um, we try to collect four dimensions of data from each individual. So genotype data from DNA test, phenotype data, um, environmental data, and also your behavior for like Fitbit and stuff like that. So obviously, neural data is uh, part of my, uh, uh, so you can do it from genetic, genetic data and phenotype data. We, um, so my question is actually to all of the panel. Um, is there anything else? We find neural data is actually very hard to collect. Um, we, we have encountered some of the uh, 
tests, for example, they, they claim that they can uh, detect your degenerative through your urine test or whatever. And also, I think Professor Pu was mentioned, you can do like a, a diagnostic through a game to see how your brain has degenerated. Is there anything else would you recommend would be a good, quick, or portable diagnostic um, to recommend for this data collection, you know, test or game or anything else? Is this Thank in normal you. people or you're collecting this data? We're, we're collecting for healthy people. Healthy, healthy people. Healthy people, just and, normal people. And these are computer savvy healthy people or these are older people who have not used computers before? Um, all the people, actually ordinary people, because our mother company is a physical examination, it's a franchise physical examination clinics in China. Okay. So, there's a booth outside called the Brain Booth. Did you see that? And there is a company that has set up an exhibit called Anthrotronics. Anthrotronics. And they have a mobile tablet-based test called Dana. It's a digital automated neurobehavioral assessment. And they have three versions of it, a five-minute version, a 30-minute version, and maybe a one-hour version. It has uh, cognitive tests. It has some behavioral assessments, depression rating, stress, resilience, sleep all of those ratings, and so it's a tablet-based uh, test. And that was the first one to get FDA clearance. Now, you have to decide, do you want to use a validated test? Do you want to use a test that's cleared by a regulatory agency in your country? So there are many variables. And, and the same test that works on an Apple iOS system may not work equally well on an Android system because they're not comparable, the reaction time uh, test. So, so maybe we can talk F offline, but uh, we struggle with the same issue. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can I, can I have another question? Yes, please. Please identify yourself. Uh, this, uh, this is Michael Lee. I'm from uh, LinkedIn. I'm uh, leading the uh, analytics and data science team at LinkedIn. So uh, I think uh, Professor Poo just uh, mentioned that uh, what could be a good incentive model right, for other people who are in this uh, big neuroscience area to come together to collaborate. I think uh, I have some uh, sort of ideas I want to run by you guys. So uh, what we have seen uh, in the software development area, right? So what we had the similar challenges used to be like, you know, what's the right incentive model for people to work together? And especially in the big data area where, where like data can be shared supposedly with everyone, right? So this is basically the question this lady just asked. I think what we found is uh, the open source product is a really good way to do that. And then because when you have this open source product, essentially everyone can contribute. And there's a centralized committee who can decide who is a key contributor for this open source product, where everybody can actually uh, benefit from it, right? But I'm not sure in the big neuroscience area, do you guys see the possibility to set up something like that? But essentially then, uh, it takes everyone to contribute to it, but also it needs to be publicly recognized by academia, by company, which is happening in the software development industry already. But I'm not sure that you know, in, the, in the big uh, neuroscience area, this is a possibility or not. I have a meeting with the CEO of Red Hat uh, next week. He's very interested in neuroscience and big neuroscience. And you're right, open data sharing is, is a problem in neuroscience. Um, one of the projects we are working at is called the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, ADNI. And one of the things about that project the principal investigator decided was they would post all of the data publicly. Normally in big neuroscience projects, you wait till the project's over, you wait till the team has written all the papers because you don't want anyone else to steal your, your publicity before you publish. But with this project, they decided they're going to post all the data open publicly for anyone from around the world to analyze, even before the study investigators have analyzed it themselves. So that could be a possible model. I think there are, um, there are things that are out there. I know there's a um, SAGE in Seattle has a, what they call a coopetition, right, where they share lots of data and then they have it be a very open format where people um, can uh, one-up each other right. um, and get full credit for it in that way. So I know that, that people are exploring those kinds of models. It's just early days right now and nothing has really truly caught fire. Um, but I think this era of big neuroscience is going to offer some pretty unique opportunities for that to happen. Okay, speaking to the microphone, and could you identify yourself, please? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm 
Greg Schwartz, an assistant professor from Northwestern, working on many of these same issues about cell types and mapping the brain. And I think, you know, I've interacted with a lot of people at the Allen Institute, and I think maybe the Allen Institute can take a larger role in leading that kind of initiative because all your data is public and it's online. And one of the things that the rest of the community lacks is professional programmers to do this right to actually make things accessible and to set those standards. That we don't have resources in small labs to do things like that, like you do at the Allen Institute. So your data is public, but finding ways to interface that with trusted labs and develop those standards and to share your computer resources with our technical resources of labs around the world. While you have a thousand people working, you can't have experts in as many areas as the rest of the community has, even in your issue, even in your specific areas of mouse vision. So maybe bringing together more of the community under that would help do exactly what Dr. Pooh said about changing the culture, because ultimately that's what's key. We need to change the incentive structure and being able to all come together and get credit. Yeah. So watch this space. Um, I know that the NIH has a, a, a very broad interest in doing exactly what you just said. Um, the Brain Initiative is continuing to get traction and additional funding, so um, I think those kinds of things are, are right around the corner. Hello, Jordan Caslow, Vision Spring. Um, a comment on, uh, or a question regarding one of your comments that talked about uh, children in poor countries having cortexes that are reduced by 6%, and then you alluded to, wouldn't it be nice if the Gates Foundation would in get, get involved with that kind of issue area. If you had the ear of Mr. Gates, what would you tell him and how could they get involved? In, in what way could they make yeah, a difference? Uh, so, so this was a correlational study done in the United States, so it was not a study done in India. So this was a study where they looked at low-income families versus uh, affluent families and just cross-sectionally compared the surface area of the brain. So it's, it's not causative, it's correlational. So it would be nice to replicate that uh, in a true sort of developing country to, to see if you can replicate it, to see if there are factors such as nutritional factors, genetic variables, others that you can sort of make a better sort of tie in with what's reversible and what's not. And then if it is nutritional, you can actually do a randomized trial to see if you can correct that. You can assign children to different arms and, and, and incentivize them. And, and there's also behavioral economic incentives that you can give to mothers and then do trials of those behavioral economic incentives. Do you give a little bit of money, a lot of money, all at once, whatever. You know? So there's a bunch of different trial designs that can be done. There's a poverty lab at MIT and Harvard that is attempting to do some studies like this. Um, and hopefully, Melinda Gates will, if she's here or if she's listening to this, will fund it. Well, I, I can just say that not as a spokesperson for the Gates Foundation, but they are our neighbors in Seattle. Yes. And I, I know that they do have scientific programs addressing exactly what you said. Yeah. So they're right. very much interested in this. Well, uh, we are almost at the end of our time, so I would like to thank uh, all of our speakers for a very stimulating uh, discussion about uh, this very exciting scientific development that's ahead of us. There clearly are some low-hanging fruits that have the promise you know, to realize some gains in public health in the near future, um, and also some very large aspirational challenges, um, but that these challenges, if we solve them, may actually stand to really change what we understand about ourselves uh, and about science. So thank you all very much for coming, and please join me in thanking the speakers. Thank you.